Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we'll talk about an update on Metro Grow indoor farming right here in Honolulu. Our guest for the show is its founder and chief executive, Kerry Kakazu. He's the president of Metro Grow Hawaii. And we want to sort of update. We had a show with Kerry, gosh, it was years ago, um, when we visited his uh, facilities there in Kaka'ako and got a handle on what he was doing and the technology he was using. I warn you, I warn you, he's a PhD in science, okay? Um, and, uh, and what he planned to do. Now we're going to find out what he's done and where he's going. How exciting. Welcome to the show, Kerry. Right. Thank you very much, Jay. I guess uh, I'm not even sure when we had that show, but I think we were at the old location on the second floor of mezzanine of the warehouse. It's yeah, I remember day. that. Yeah, yeah, like yesterday. Yeah. Right, so, right on, was it Oahe Street, was it? Yeah, correct. Very good. Yeah. So yeah, since then, I mean, you know, we, we got off and yeah, we got that going pretty well. Uh, found that uh, we were specializing in selling to restaurants and that uh, quickly, you know, pretty much used up our capacity in that small space. So we started looking for a new space. And so finally in 2020, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, uh, we got our new operation going. Um, it, was, it was good and bad, you know, it gave us a little bit more time to kind of get into the rhythm of growing in a different space. Uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, our restaurant uh, sales were like nothing, mm -hmm. uh, like everybody else. So we started uh, quickly pivoting to online sales and farmers markets once they reopened. So now we're kind of doing both. Our restaurants are still our primary market. Accounts for about uh, probably about eighty percent of our sales. Uh, but now with the farmers markets and online, uh, you know, we can get more revenue that way. So diversified in that uh, respect. Yeah, you make me think we ought to do your slideshow now. So how about that? You want to do okay. a slideshow with me? Sure. So yeah, what we're uh, having here is since we you know, have done this now for 10 years, uh, and again, in 2020, we moved here. So we've done this now for four years for this location. And when we got visitors coming through, the big question was always, um, this is great. You know, you're selling to restaurants or the specialty produce. Uh, what can you do for the community at large? Uh, can you scale this to a level where you can produce general food production for uh, local residents? So, I, well, I, you know, I said, sure, uh, we can do that. Of course, we need a much bigger operation. Uh, and then what we did find over the past 10 years is that uh, uh, there are some definite limitations to what we can do. And the cost of production is a lot higher uh, for this kind of growing. So what can we? Uh, so we started exploring what things we could do to make this a little bit more cost-effective and scale it up to where we could grow lettuces and leafy greens for, uh, I guess we want to call it just the general public sales. So what we did is we put together this sort of pitch that we were trying to uh, publicize to everybody that we can. Basically, is how would we expand? How would we make the next generation of this kind of vertical farming? So that's what this slide deck is now. So um, okay. you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I think as everyone knows, 90% of our produce is imported in Hawaii. And so obviously we want to change that situation and make sure we can get more local produce. And I think one of the drivers for this additional local production is that the state in 2019 passed a law that says uh, that all state agencies need to purchase 30% uh, of their produce locally or food locally by 2030 and then 50% by 2050. And we looked at the Department of Education, who's probably the largest buyer in the state. Uh, and right now they're at about 6%. So obviously got a long way to go. Um, so we thought, okay, here's something where we can address that. Uh, they often cite the fact that it's difficult for them to buy from small farms because they need to get a pretty large supply and they need to get it pretty consistent. And so small farms often have a little bit harder time uh, meeting those requirements. And also food safety is gonna be very important. And some of our smaller farms are not always uh, food safety compliant or have a hard time getting to that level. So that's where we think we can step in and uh, uh, in increase that supply. Next slide. 
So again, the state law is one thing that we think will drive this uh, demand for more local produce. And of course, even just consumer preference. Uh, we know people are always interested in seeing local produce when they go to restaurants or in their supermarkets. So definitely that um, demand has gone up. And uh, people realize that local produce is gonna be fresher, higher quality, hopefully grown sustainably because it doesn't have to travel thousands of miles to get here. And then we also see that, uh, you know, severe weather events and the pandemic led to a recogni recognition of supply chain problems locally. So people said, well, we're gonna start growing our own food a little bit more to make sure that we have a supply in case something like that disrupts us again. Okay. So these are all things I think that are driving local demand, but we haven't really moved the needle very much on increasing that. And a lot of it is our supply is constrained. So, you know, problems that people face now is access to land and water is pretty limited uh, here in Hawaii, or it's getting more limited. Uh, we're seeing more and more unpredictable weather as the climate has changed. And then lots of pest pressure. Farmers here will tell you that because our climate is very good for growing, it's also very good for growing pests. And so that's definitely an issue with a lot of farming that's done traditionally. So we think that vertical farming is one way to help address a lot of these concerns. Next slide. So what is vertical farming? And um, Jay, you know, and uh, just as a refresher, it's uh, basically hydroponic indoor growing in a controlled environment. So when you do it that way, you use much less land and water. Uh, we're independent of the weather conditions. Uh, we use very little chemicals, no pesticides at all. Uh, we do use fertilizers still, but um, other than that, there's no uh, toxic sprays that we're uh, having to put on our produce. And another nice thing is it's inherently more food safe. So there's very little risk of contamination from outside agents. Uh, we can do production year round. Uh, we can do really quick yields because of that. And again, because of the lack of transport and uh, the protected environment. Usually it's fresher, higher quality, and more nutritious. Okay, next slide. So again, uh, you know, these are all great things. And as I mentioned, it's really difficult for us to control some of these expenses that we have uh, for growing this way. And what we found is the biggest expenses we have are first rent. Uh, so uh, that's, again, just a matter of how much space we have. And the fact that we are doing this in commercial properties. So that's another issue that kind of separate from everything else. But the other big one is energy. And this is happening for all vertical farms. Uh, costs of electricity, because a lot of this is indoor or electrical lighting and um, air conditioning or some kind of air uh, temperature control. So obviously very electricity hungry. So we need to really address that issue in order to be able to scale up and do this kind of economically. And we see this across the whole industry, not just Hawaii, but uh, even on the US mainland, um, we see that people are struggling with the cost of doing vertical farm. So now we have the double whammy is, it is nationwide that, that people are facing this. And then we're in Hawaii, where of course electricity is the highest it is in anywhere in the country. So we need to really address that problem. So a lot of things that we're looking at for in our expansion are new technologies that will help us mitigate the cost of uh, operating indoors. So the first technology that we're really looking at is this uh, picture you see here is a rotating tower. And this is a vertical growing tower. Uh, it comes from a company in Singapore. And what she's looking at right here is an A-frame. And you see kind of a black wheel at the bottom of the A-frame. And so that's actually a water wheel. So what happens is the company will have a pump it will send the water up to the top of the tower. And as it falls through the water wheel, that will make the tower rotate. And so it's kind of like a Ferris wheel for plants. And so it's really space efficient, as you can see, because these can get up to about 20 to 30 feet high. Each tray has a whole bunch of plants and you can just do regular potty mix or do it hydroponically. Uh, but the nice thing is now, as you can see, this is in a greenhouse. So the plants get equal amounts of light. Um, since they're always rotating through the sunlight. So you don't need very much or any at all, in some cases, artificial light. So that we feel will really bring down the cost of 
uh, growing indoors if we can utilize the plentiful sunlight that we have in Hawaii. So rather than housing these in a big warehouse like we do now, uh, we do a greenhouse or greenhouse type structure uh, to utilize our natural uh, plentiful sunlight. Okay, next slide. Uh, the second technology we're gonna bring in is, we mentioned greenhouses and they, they work fine. They aren't quite as well sealed as we like for some of our protected growing. So we've identified this uh, fabric tension greenhouse. Uh, these structures are used uh, in a bunch of different situations as a way to get quick buildings. It's an aluminum and steel frame. And what you see stretched over that is a, a fabric, a very durable fabric, fabric, and it's just kind of stretched over the frame and um, allows really good sealing on the structures. So uh, they also come in this very translucent fabric. And so what they can do now is because it transmits a lot of light, you basically now have a greenhouse structure um, for uh, that it simulates a greenhouse, but with better control over the interior environment. Okay, next slide. So by combining these two things, again, what we've done now is we've uh, reduced the lighting costs, uh, put it in a controlled structure that's pretty easy to build and quick, uh, hopefully a little bit less than refurbishing the warehouse. And so we think this will be a much more efficient, more sustainable vertical farm. And because of the compact size, uh, from what we can grow now, which you see on the top picture is rows and rows of plants under LED lights, uh, we can space-wise, uh, get 10 times more production out of the same amount of space. So we using less space to keep that rent cost down, using a lot less electricity uh, to keep uh, that expense down. And we think then we can get to a point where this would be an economical system. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, we want to target state agencies, uh, you know, some distributors, healthcare, education, any uh, institution that needs a little bit larger supply than a typical small farm can produce. So we think that with this system that we just described, we can probably produce about a um, thousand pounds of leafy greens per week. So that's a pretty substantial amount, you know, maybe not quite the giant size that the farms of the uh, California and Arizona can do, but for Hawaii, a pretty good size. And then we can start addressing uh, these larger demand customers like the Department of Education, uh, like hotels, like distributors, uh, with a system now that will produce this uh, indoor grown, uh, very clean produce. Next slide. So, you know, obviously we're gonna try and do these contracts with the institutional buyers. Uh, we also still wanna increase our uh, presence in the retail market. And we can brand, I think Metro Hawaii as sort of a, a premium brand, it's still reasonably priced, but definitely a higher quality. Uh, vertical farming is really best for doing leafy greens uh, because of the uh, quick growing and turnaround, doesn't take up too much space, and it's pretty good high demand, something that maybe sometimes is hard to import because of the fragile nature of the leafy greens. So that'll probably be our focus initially, and that's what we know how to grow now. But well, we definitely want to look at diversifying the crop profile as we move on and do look at some of these higher margin, sort of more uh, premium crops to supplement uh, the uh, sale of the premium leafy greens. One that we're really interested in is something like strawberries, which uh, there are some very high end uh, vertical farms that are specializing in these kinds of fruits. So that and herbs, uh, we think that we can add that to our leafy greens. Again, we can increase our revenue and make this even more economical. Okay, next slide. So who are, um, as every business plan, we have to identify our competitors. So actually there's a kind of limited number of farms here in Hawaii that can produce a fairly large volume of leafy greens. Uh, so the big players right now are Kunina Country Farms, uh, Mari's Gardens, uh, Sensei on Lanai, uh, Pacific Produce, which is uh, Waipoli Greens on Maui, and a pretty new one just established is uh, Hawaii Farming. Uh, they actually may be more familiar to everybody as the uh, Keiki Cukes. They grow a lot of cucumbers in greenhouses, but they're also now starting to do lettuces. Um, so this is kind of the market we're coming into. Uh, but of course, we'll be the only one that's an indoor protected farm, uh, fully protected. 
and with only a vertical farm. So we think we'll have a little bit of advantage there. Also, we're one of the three that will be on Oahu. Uh, the other uh, three mentioned are on the neighbor islands. So, you know, I think the cost of bringing that kind of produce over to Oahu uh, be a little bit of a detriment. Okay. Uh, next slide. So um, people ask, you know, how, you know, how, why us and how can we do this? Well, we have, again, 10 years of experience in growing indoors. Uh, a lot of media has covered us. Uh, so we're pretty well established in the uh, farming market. And, um, uh, you know, we've, again, we know a lot about this. And if the next slide, uh, you can see some of the customers that we've worked with. So a lot of our pretty good restaurants here in Hawaii. And then so now, again, some of the markets like Foodland, uh, Chef Zone, buy some of our products. Uh, we sell to Manson, which is another produce distributor. So these customers all have you know, experienced our produce and have really appreciated the high quality and long shelf life and our really uh, attention to detail to service them and their needs. Okay, next slide. Uh, we're also really excited because you know this is a new technology with the vertical growing towers. So, so it was suggested maybe we should try and bring in a smaller version of this and test it out. And so we actually have a partnership that we just established with Kamiki High School. And so sometime in the fall, actually uh, the truck just picked it up from the manufacturer yesterday. So we're gonna bring in a couple of these growing towers, a uh, smaller version, and we're gonna build them up at Kamiki High School. And the students will help run that and learn how to use it. And we'll get data also about how well it works and uh, what things uh, we need to work on or improve to get it to be the fullest production. So we we're lucky to get some money from the DOE and Ulupono Initiative was also very generous in providing some funds for us to get this pilot project going. And so again, we hope that we start growing or building that uh, right at the start of this semester. Okay, next slide. So we've established a pretty good growing team. Uh, myself, again, I, I do have a plant science degree uh, from UC Davis. And um, I was, again, doing this for 10 years. Uh, we also engaged uh, Christy, who's our sort of a business officer. She's actually based on the East Coast, but she is originally from Hawaii. Uh, but she has all the business background, has been involved with startups before and a lot of big companies. So she's been a really uh, big asset for helping us work on the business side of things. And then all of our farm assistants that we have now are almost all from uh, graduates or students at the University of Hawaii. So they all have ag backgrounds. So it's really helpful in this kind of growing so that they have, you know, they know exactly what to do and what to expect from seeing how we grow. Okay, next slide. Uh, so we can skip this one. I don't wanna pitch money for you guys, but, <laughs> but that's what we're trying to grow. So actually you can go back up one. Let's go back up. So we do want to get, a, like I said, about a 5,000 square foot greenhouse, the fabric tension one that I mentioned. That will fit about 24 towers. And as I mentioned, okay, actually 2,000 pounds. I think I said 1,000. But um, that was a scaled down version, I forgot. So we can, we think we can get about 2,000 pounds of greens weekly from that 5,000 square foot greenhouse. So it'll be a pretty productive system. Uh, and then we're looking at additional technologies. Um, anaerobic digester will take our farm waste and other food waste and can produce uh, methane gas, which can be used to produce electricity. And it also produces uh, organic fertilizer as a side product. So we'll be able to use that in the farm also. And of course, you want to add solar panels. We have that now for our current farm, but we also want to put it on this site so we can really get to a point where the energy use is very low. Okay, next slide. So we really think that this project could be a very transformative uh, project for our state. It's a new agriculture. Uh, it's gonna really increase our food supply, uh, provide some economic, uh, hopefully diversity to our economy, uh, and then be a very innovative and something we can use for education. So the Kaimiki project will be at the start of it. But what we hope is that this will be a, a motivation for other people that may want to get into ag and maybe not as enamored of working in the field, here's a new kind of technology, a new kind of agriculture that can supplement what we're doing now and then attract a new uh, class of 
uh, future farmers and innovators. Okay, uh, next slide. And I think that's it. So that's our vision of the future. Uh, like I said, we're going around and hopefully get some interest from uh, investors and uh, seeing if we can build this next generation farm. Hey, Kerry, that was great. I do have about 50 questions, if you don't <laughs> mind. Sure. <laughs> What about the university? What about Sitar? <clears throat> Sitar has land. It has some greenhouses up there. This would be a perfect venue for another unit of, of uh, Metro Grow. What do you think? Yeah, so um, I haven't approached, uh, supposedly, the, yeah, I just got a new dean recently, and I heard that he's very interested in uh, this kind of urban agriculture. So I, I mean to, I need to approach him. I, I had talked to this one of the previous deans, but kept turning over. So. <laughs> Uh, never got too much traction with that. Uh, they don't have a lot of um, professors doing this kind of work. They do hydroponics, and uh, but it's not as much urban stuff, more organic. Uh, but like I said, with the new team, I think this will be another opportunity to re-engage them and, and see what we can develop. But yeah, if they have space, that'll be great. Before I forget, I want to put you in touch with a guy in Singapore. You said you got that conveyor belt um, you know, uh, device from Singapore. Uh -huh. He he sells those things, and he does venture capital on vertical farming companies all over the world from oh, Singapore. I want to put you in touch. I also want to put you in touch with the Hawaii Restaurant Association, because in my view, every restaurant ought to be using your products. You know? mm. um, they, and they're very agreeable, and they're nice people. The other thing I wanted to mention and, and ask you about is, is the competition. You have this very interesting chart. And uh, really, uh, MetroGrow is ahead of the rest of them, but are they actively competing with you? Are they, you know, uh, in, in deploying these devices? Uh, are they are they on your tail, so to speak, and trying to do the same thing? Or are you are you unique? Well, actually, I would say we're kind of more on their tail because um, you know we haven't scaled up to the level that they produce. Um, Kunia Country Farms is probably the biggest producer in my mind. Uh, they actually have some of the DOE contracts. They supply zippies. Um, and they are uh, aquaponic, so they utilize the fish and the cyclical nature of that operation where the tilapia feeds the fertilizer to plants. Uh, but it is totally outdoors. So I think you know, there's a little bit of seasonality for them because when it gets too hot, it's a little bit more difficult to grow. Mm. Uh, Mari's is a pretty significant amount. They do it in greenhouses, so a little bit more protected. Um, they have not really engaged as much as I can see with the, um, like the DOE, et cetera, uh, but they have a pretty good presence in retail. So we're, you know, again, just trying to maybe not squeeze in there, but, um, be another player. And like I said, with the seasonality that may affect somebody like Korea Country Farm, which is outdoors, you know, we can provide and fill in the gap where, uh, okay, summer is too hot for lettuce, so no problem for us. Um, you, you talked about the need for electricity and it reminds me of um, Richard Ha, who ran Hamakua Farms in Hamakua mm -hmm. for a long time. And, and he was quotable to say, uh, if the farmer makes money, the farmer will farm. Um, and a lot of that was the cost of electricity. In the Big yeah. Island, it's expensive. You know? um, and of course, we have the blackouts and rolling blackouts here with one electric. And we're going to see more of that. Um, you know, they're they're having trouble because of the Maui fire and, and the fallout from that. And so, uh, A, have you, have you suffered from that? Uh, B, have you got backup systems? Um, and C, what do you expect in the future in order to preserve, you know, your crop? So right now, our current facility is in a uh, two-story building. And the landlord was nice enough to let me put solar panels on his roof. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we're 2,000 square feet. Uh, the roof space that we have solar panels on is a little bit bigger than that, because we have we don't have the whole bottom floor. Um, it provides about 35% of our electricity right now, if it's a good sunny day. So that helps, but it's not enough. And so any space that we do is, we're, you know, if you just cover the roof, and obviously you can't cover the greenhouse, uh, but we have the same amount of space as the farm for the solar panels, it's not going to be enough. So, you know, we're thinking if we can get a larger space with some extra space, uh, we can make some of you know, almost like a solar farm adjacent to the greenhouse. Um, 
Again, we mentioned the anaerobic digester. It doesn't produce a lot of energy, but it does produce biogas, which can be burned as a fuel. Um, people kind of look at that and are sort of negative on it because it's methane. But again, if we're burning it and getting CO2 back out, it's kind of a net zero because that carbon came from food waste. Um, and then we're going to change it to methane, get some electricity out of it, and then release the CO2 back. And the other thing we're looking at is we could actually probably get some of that CO2 and capture it and feed it to the plants. So uh -huh. maybe even better off that way in reducing the greenhouse gas. So that's a little bit down the line. But by adding additional uh, renewable energy sources, you know, my, my biggest goal would be, can we get to be off grid? Um, I don't know if that's possible, but we certainly want to look at that. And now again, you know, we're 35% uh, renewable with this totally indoor, totally air conditioned, fully lighted uh, system. So once we start doing this new system, I think we can get down you know, and get a lot more of our electricity source from renewable. Uh, we have Tesla backed up batteries here and uh, that helps. Uh, when the whole lights are on, the air conditioning on, it doesn't last very long, um, but it, it does provide a backup at least for if a blackout happens. Mm. Yeah, really, we don't want you to lose your crops. Um, the, the other thing is one of the slides you mentioned other products, and, mm -hmm. I, and I thought I saw a, a, a berry of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> what, what have you got in mind? Uh, so, yeah, strawberries are something that a lot of vertical farms are looking at. And there's a company in New Jersey called Oishi, and uh, it's a Japanese uh, guy, and they produce these super, super high-end strawberries. And I think when they started, it was a package of 11, and I think it was like $50. <laughs> so that's how you make money at vertical farming, I guess, if you can get that kind of crop. <laughs> but they could do it because it was totally indoors, super protected. They even had uh, bumblebees that they kept inside of the building to pollinate the strawberries. <clears throat> but um, now they're starting to diversify a little bit, a little bit more economical <clears throat> strawberries, a larger farm uh they're doing high-end tomatoes now too so you know again those crops obviously are not going to be something you're going to feed the state with but as a way to increase diversify our revenue stream i definitely want to think we want to look at some of those and there's no reason why you can't i mean your systems no. will allow growing yeah. those crops like i said in fact the company uh that i said i mean i found the system in canada but they have a north american distributor or manufacturer also and in Canada. And so they started off and got these systems from Singapore and actually first thing they grew their strawberries. So they know how to do it. It worked out fine. You know, one of Hawaii's, um, what do I call it? Uh, iconic crops, it's flowers. Flowers mm -hmm. for lays, flowers for the home. I can tell you my wife is really connected with flowers. Um, and I wonder if you'd ever consider growing flowers in one of these uh, facilities. So we actually do grow, and we haven't done it for a while, but we have some uh, varieties of edible flowers that the restaurants like to use. Uh, the, of course, anything that flowers or fruits is going to take a little bit longer to grow. So you're not going to get quite the quick turnaround. Uh, but they are, you know, you can get a little bit more money for them. So they're worth growing. Uh, we haven't really looked at lay flowers very much. And of course, um, you know, anything that is going to grow very large would be difficult to do in this kind of farm. So it has yeah. to be something maybe a vine type of flower or uh, which most of the edible flowers are. Um, I actually was looking when we were looking at greenhouse spaces about uh, doing picake. Um, since, you know, that actually is a warm weather plant. So we wouldn't have to worry much about cooling or air conditioning. Uh, well, what I was told was the imports are so cheap now that it's hard for the local farms to make a go of it. How do your prices compare with, um, you know, the su supermarket uh, supply chains? So, again, we're kind of specializing the lettuces and the microgreens. Like, for example, the lettuce, uh, we market it as a living lettuce because the root plug is still attached. And you'll see that in Safeway and Times once in a while. Um, so it stays fresher for a lot longer. Uh, so we're pretty close to that price. We're still a little higher. Again, just the you know, cost of doing business in Hawaii. And the microgreens were on, on a par with other providers, um, slightly more expensive. But again, you know, we're hoping the customers that use us know that you know, our, they, they like the quality or they like certain aspects of 
what we grow um, versus just some generic stuff. And I know I've, the, all the local microgreen producers are doing pretty well, but I've seen some come in from the mainland uh, farms that the, the microgreens just don't last long enough that by the time they get here, they're just not very good quality. That goes to the whole question of geography, which you talked about in your slideshow. And, you know, it seems to me that if you wanted to achieve that immediacy, that complete freshness, it's a, it's a really great selling point for anybody who cares, you know, about produce. Um, you'd want to have a facility like this everywhere, uh, for example, uh, on the, the neighbor islands. Yeah. Um, although I suppose a ferry would have helped, but that's really not um, a, a policy possibility right now. Um, but don't you think it would be useful to have the same kind of facility, say, on the Big Island or on Kauai or Maui, um, maybe especially Maui, given the problems on Maui? Um, is this something in the future for you? Yeah, actually, I didn't put that on the slide deck. But uh, one thing we think that this kind of technology is, it's very exportable to any other island type community, not just Hawaii. Uh, anybody who is isolated, uh, who doesn't have or has uh, electricity is very expensive, uh, but with lots of natural sunlight and um, maybe limited in water, you know, this would fit in, in all those kind of communities. And uh, again, it's, it, you know, again, we can produce quite a bit, but it's only 5,000 square feet. So, you know, you can kind of fit it in almost anywhere. You don't need a big chunk of land. Um, and you don't need ag land, obviously. So, yeah. Definitely the neighbor islands, a smaller market. So, again, we can even maybe adjust it accordingly for what the needs are. Um, but yeah, exporting it to the other communities, definitely in the future. Well, those, those uh, facilities could be yours. They could be franchised or they could yeah. be an ordinary person. I remember aquaponics when it was all the rage in aquaponics. Uh, there were people who were developing aquaponics facilities in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and consuming the produce. Yeah. So it seems to me that um, if, you, if you scaled this back, maybe, and you didn't have such a big uh, conveyor and, you know, heavy equipment like that, if you made it small for somebody, somebody's backyard or even Lanai, they could use your technology in growing their own uh, produce. Isn't that possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, could you do that? Would you do that? The tower is probably a little bit too big. The smallest one they have is 10 feet high. So I don't know too many people whose lanai's will fit that, um, you know. But a good sized backyard would probably be okay. Um, yeah. Again, you know that was sort of the market where there's a lot of systems out there that can take the whole market um, part into account. Uh, but we're obviously looking at a commercial scale. But you know some of those lessons that we learn are definitely can be downsized. One of the interesting things that company in Singapore, Sky Greens. Uh, actually has been trying to push a franchise model. So they'll basically sell you and drop you. They'll build the greenhouse for you. Uh, 5,000 seems to be the size they've kind of settled on. And then they'll fill it with towers and um, you know, give you all the instructions and you go to it. And then uh, you can sort of, it's sort of a lease to own kind of situation. So what's the future, you know, of uh, vertical farming in Hawaii? Uh, you know, I, I consider it high tech. I consider it a, sort of the promise of the future. On the other hand, um, you know, we do have land. We do have land for agriculture. We have a, an historic, um, you know, affinity uh, uh, for agriculture on the land. Mm -hmm. We have reasonably good weather most of the time. Um, although, you know, I guess it would be a serious problem if we had extreme weather because of climate change yeah. or sea level rise. Um, so you have advantages there. But going forward, you know, is this what we need to do uh, to make our food local? Because right now, aside from you um, and, you know, some of the people on the chart, most, most of our food, 90% of it comes from the mainland. Yeah. Uh, is that going to change? Do you see a future where that's going to change? Well, so that's why I um, asked, you know, when, when I saw those figures, I, I I talked to some people and is it because it's just so much cheaper? And that's part of it, I think, is economics. But uh, no, it was just, it, they said supply was a big thing. So you, you're correct. You know, I think land is available. Not all of it is farmable, uh, even if it's classified as ag. Uh, infrastructure is lacking. I think a lot of people tell you that. Not enough, you know, irrigation lines. Um, if you need power, it's hard to get out there. So I think that's the big one of the biggest voting uh, <clears throat> stumbling blocks is just the lack of infrastructure 
for a diversified farm. It was in plantation land for so long that you had just acres and acres where you, pineapple and sugarcane maybe had limited uh, ir irrigation needs. But for the diversified crops, you kind of need that infrastructure. Yeah, the soil composition is, isn't quite right if it was in that pineapple too, yeah. or sugar. You have to re yeah. recondition the soil. So, yeah, you know, a lot of people now are looking at regenerative farming. So, that, you know, that's great. It's going to take some time and a lot of effort. Uh, so, although it seems like we have land, I don't know how much of it, how productive it's going to be right off the bat. So, yeah, we don't, you know, have any illusion that we're going to replace that kind of farming. We think that for certain kinds of crops where you kind of want to protect the environment, like I said, leafy greens are ideal. Uh, you know, grow your tree crops, your bread, your ulu, uh, kalo, outdoors, great. You know, you have that kind of land. Uh, but lettuce and all those kind of things, we can take that out from the field grown stuff and uh, save it, save that land for those kind of crops that really need it. It strikes me that we have enough land to build a lot of metro grow facilities. <laughs> <laughs> we could take that agricultural land and make it into metro grow. We'd have enough enough produce to feed everyone. Yeah. I guess there are two other issues I wanted to explore with you. Number one is uh, is uh, is is water. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned irrigation systems, and um, how much water do you need? Is this is this efficient? Is this system efficient on water? Can you get along with less water, uh, for example, than open agriculture, open diversified agriculture? Yeah, I mean that's one of the biggest advantages that everybody that got into vertical farming mentions. And we've taken a few uh, measurements, not super rigorous, but because I, I was kind of skeptical of what people were claiming. But we found that we use about 90% less water than a traditional wow. outdoor farm. Because what we do is we're using, we actually use city water. Um, and then uh, we are recirculating it because we're hydroponic. So it doesn't run off. Uh, we recirculate it, it gets taken up by the plants and we replenish it. Uh, so in fact, we don't dump very much at all because the plants pretty much use it all. And then we refill it. So um, yeah, we've done some estimates. The, the best way I can illustrate this is my landlord um, has the water meter and he didn't really want to have to go through the trouble of trying to split that off. So he said, you know, we'll see. And, and uh, he didn't charge me for the water at first. So I said, well, you know, we are growing plants. So you check it and if it gets too high in your bill, let me know and see what we can do. And so we've You're been here four man. years. <laughs> yeah, we've been here four years and he hasn't charged me for the water yet. <laughs> so I think we're doing Local okay. Style. <laughs> no, I, I really I think it's yeah, it, it's his water bill has not gone up that significant. Yeah, ah, that's really an important point, especially considering that in the future we we may have water problems. Yeah, that was definitely was one of the first things in my mind was, yeah, we got land, but how much fresh water are we going to have going forward? You know, uh, I went to uh, the the Mission Houses Museum. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Poopoo -poo, poo -poo dinner at the Oahu Cemetery. If you've ever uh -huh. been, it's really interesting. And one of the speakers was a woman who was a Japanese immigrant. I mean, these are, these are all people who died in the cemetery. Um, and she was an actress, and she talked about life on the plantations um, back in the, I guess, uh, uh, after the immigrants began fielding them. And it was a hard life, and and the yeah. and the image that she gave us was the number of people out there. Um, and it, it was not sophisticated. There was not all that much mechanism, you know, automation, and so they worked really hard in the broiling sun and all that. And it was hard. It was hard on everyone who came, whatever persuasion you were. While you're talking, I'm thinking, gee whiz, you don't have to have a a team of labor. To operate Metro Grow, yeah. uh, and you haven't mentioned a team of labor. Your your <laughs> staffing is small, relatively. So it is automated, and you never have to go to hiring hundreds, thousands of of field hands in order to grow your produce. Um, am I right about this? There's this. You need very little human resources. So there's all a, a big spectrum of that. Uh, we're kind of in average. So, you know, our workers uh, saw the quick picture. They do uh, most of the harvesting and the planting. There are machines that can do that. Uh, we just obviously don't have enough capital to, to invest in them. Uh, but uh, you can get those machines. So seeding and harvesting are still done by hand. 
Uh, but one of the nice things that we like about that uh, Sky Tower system is some of the vertical farms have rows and rows of um, plants that go up maybe 20 feet. And so then you see a man lift. They come down the aisle with a man lift and they go up to the top, bring a tray down and thinking, boy, that's a lot of work. So the Sky Green system, because it's rotating like this, the plants actually come down to the bottom level and the workers just sit there and pull up the lettuce and then rotate the next one, pull up the lettuce. So we really like the idea that, you know, that improved the workflow a lot. So it's not quite automated, but definitely uh, a lot less moving around than a typical field or even another vertical farm. So yeah, those are the kind of things we're looking at. Uh, like I said, the super high tech guys with the tons of money have robots that do all of this too now. It's just, that's how much mechanism. Unfortunately, yeah. because that investment is so high and those robots are so specialized, I, my feeling is that uh, you know if something changes or they do a new crop, uh, it's going to be tough to retool. Uh, so you really got to get to a large scale, I think, to justify that kind of automation. Yeah. What about uh, what about computer analysis of how how far, how 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 much the crop has grown and when it's time mm -hmm. to harvest? Uh, I'm sure there's um, without changing a whole lot of. A lot, a lot of the hardware, it seems to me that you could use AI, for example, mm -hmm. to determine exactly when it's ready. Are you? Will you? You think about that? Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of, again, a lot of vertical farms uh, in the, on the continental U.S. are looking into this or are employing it. Uh, even back in 2019, before AI was even much of a thing, I went to a show in Japan, and the big thing was drones. Drones flying over the field with cameras and you know, basically being able to see the condition of the field. And then even the vertical farms where they could take the camera imaging and just do an analysis. Okay, this one is this red or this one is this green and this one's ready to pick because it's the right size just by looking at those kind of parameters. And uh, and so the, you know, the farmer was somewhere miles and miles away and was able to then direct the worker at the site saying, yeah, pick that one, that one, that one, that one. So you take your expert and really spread them all these different sites because they don't have to be at each individual location. So that, you know, now with the AI, you don't even need the expert anymore. You can kind of program all that in. And yeah, a lot of people are doing that to determine when to pick and when the robot should be picking to go all the way to the hands off. So there are a couple of farms that advertise that they are totally human free uh, from seeding to harvest. Uh, that seems pretty remarkable to me, but uh, that's, that is possible already. Yeah, well, who knows where it goes? Uh, you know, even before I ever met you, Kerry, <clears throat> I was aware of vertical farming going on in Singapore because uh, mm -hmm. I have uh, godson lives there, and um, and I was aware of a very large vertical farm facility in the state of Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's still operating or how big it is, but. Um, I didn't have the feeling that there were vertical farms all over the country, and I, mm -hmm. I don't have that feeling now. And I wonder if you think in the future we are going to see more vertical farms, larger vertical farms, um, you know, uh, around the mainland. Because, I mean, you remember, we've seen so many, so much footage of agricultural land which has been rendered um, fallow because they couldn't get the water. So if you have a minimal need for water, you can take that land and and put the technology in and you wouldn't need so much water. So uh, I, I would say there's there's got to be possibilities virtually everywhere, especially in California, which is uh, such a, you know, such an agricultural center anyway. Your thoughts about that? So actually, yeah, I mean, um, you know, since we first talked, um, there was a big boom in vertical farms on in the on the U.S. continent. And California has a company called Plenty, which is one of the big players. Uh, Aero Farms in New Jersey was one of the first, the pioneers. Uh, Aero Farms, unfortunately, did declare bankruptcy recently, but they're, I think, emerging <laughs> from that. So that's unfortunately the, the situation. So from about 2016 to 2019, it was this giant boom, and millions and maybe even billions of dollars were being invested with the automation, with the super large scale. Aero Farms, I think at the time was like 70,000 square feet. Um, Plenty is probably somewhere near there. So yeah, huge um, operations with tons of equipment, and 
high energy bills probably. Uh, but that was, you know, everybody was on board. Like this is the next thing. And uh, it's kind of looks like a tech investment. And then um, as a lot of these tech kind of things go, there was sort of the, okay, here's the reality. It's still growing plants. Um, you know, it's not a piece of software. It's not going to just generate millions of dollars overnight. You still got to grow the plants. It's going to take time. And no farm can get the kind of returns that the tech investment uh, can get. And so I think investors then got kind of spooked. And then a lot of the money started coming back out. And that's why we saw a whole rash of uh, bankruptcies or closings. And my impression has been it's, yeah, those that had a lot of venture capital put in are the ones that are were struggling because it was just unrealistic expectations mm. uh, that this is going to change things overnight. Uh, now, so uh, this is, I guess, a thing called the Gartner, I forget the exact name of it, but they said, okay, we were uh, in the past couple of years in the trough of disillusionment. This is a technical term. And so now we're hopefully coming up to a rise where we have now realistic expectations. And so the ones that had solid financials and uh, good planning are, are the ones that are surviving and will now move towards more profitability. Hmm. Yeah, well, that, that takes me to m m another business question, and that is, would you, I assume you're a profit corporation rather than a nonprofit, if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, me. we are organized as a profit company. A company, company. Uh, sometimes I wonder if we are, but. <laughs> Touche. So a query whether you would ever consider a merger, an acquisition, uh, going public, God bless, uh, anything like that. Do you have that on your personal horizon? Um, yeah, we've uh, not so much going public. Again, you know, that's where I see a lot of the companies uh, kind of ran into problems because once you got investors or venture capitalists, uh, expectations are different. Um, I mean, you know, like I would say never. But my, for the more immediate, uh, you know, I'm, I'm retirement age, so uh, I would like to find a successor or somebody who would like to get involved and uh, maybe eventually take it over. But uh, you know, my role, I feel, my value is as like the chief scientific officer. Uh, I have the background, I have the experience. So I'd be happy to be in that role uh, instead of running the whole business side. So definitely, uh, you know, we entertain that kind of uh, attractions. Yeah, but be careful because I know you love your work. I know you. <laughs> I know you love this project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I said if I was a chief science officer, I'd be okay. <laughs> One last thing is: Did you ever consider uh, opening a restaurant? I remember the Sheraton had a restaurant, and on the wall of this restaurant it was really interesting. They were growing all these all these vertical plants on the wall huh? right there in the restaurant. And and it was a big selling point. You know, you went to that restaurant because you know you wanted local food, you wanted mm, organic, natural food that grows on the wall. Um, would would Metro Grow ever consider open its own restaurant? So we haven't done that, uh, gone that far. I know enough chefs to know that. Uh, I've been watching the bear enough that uh, <laughs> it's kind of too scary to open a restaurant. Uh, but uh, we actually have done a couple of uh, situations where. Restaurants that said, can I put a system like this in our, our restaurant? And so there's an example of scaling down. Uh, the difficulty was that most of these uh, you know, restaurants, and I, I watch them, I know how busy they are. Number one, they don't have much space in their kitchens. And number two is you know, who's going to take care of the plants? Because um, it, even though it, it's growing and it's a fairly automated system, somebody still needs to watch it and, maintain it and harvest it. Uh, so we tried uh, with one Japanese restaurant where we brought stuff in. Um, but again, they didn't have a staff that wanted to do it. So we would have to go over kind of like a plant service, basically. And yeah. so that turned out to be a lot more work. So by the time you do that, it got pretty expensive. So we couldn't, we didn't succeed with that. Um, I think uh, Mugen is trying that in the Spacio Hotel uh, with a different company. Uh, Down to Earth actually was interested in putting in a hydroponic system into their store. So we were working on that and went pretty far with that. But again, when they saw the cost and the upkeep and everything, uh, it was just a little bit too much. But now there's a lot of these uh, shipping container farms. And mm. so a bunch of people are trying to bring that in. And um, I have some reservations of that as far as a commercial venture. But it's, you know, shipping containers about 320 square feet. It's a pretty small size. 
it's kind of tight in there. So I don't know how much you could do for food safety or processing, et cetera. But as a small scale farm, I think that could be a solution too. And um, so I know somebody's trying to bring that in to house at different uh, condominium developments. And um, thing with the Kobayashi group actually. And then that way they can have this freight farm that they can use to supply their residents or supply the restaurants that are in the development. Oh, that's great. Well, you got to keep your eye on the market. You got to keep your eye on what's going on yep. locally in terms of uh, classical agriculture and, and nationally. Um, but if you do open a restaurant or somehow get involved, <laughs> yeah. uh, I do like know, to cook. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and these have these leafy green products that you grow. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you a question. You know, I am I am actually wild about Caesar's dressing. My wife thinks it's a you know it's uh, some kind of uh, uh, psychological thing, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, will will your leafy greens work with Caesar's dressing? And is it the best dressing I could use on your leafy greens? <laughs> yes, uh, we grow <laughs> one type of lettuce, a sweet crisp, which is a little bit butter lettuce is really tender, so, you know, great for sandwiches and salads. Uh, but we have a sweet crisp, which is a little bit hardier lettuce, so it's uh, I think better than romaine. But similar in texture, so it would be perfect for Caesar. And if you go to Fet, uh, Robin's you know been a customer for from her start. Um, she has a salad which features that sweet crisp lettuce that she likes to use, and she said the green goddess dressing goes really well with it. So that's the other one. You're making me hungry. <laughs> so uh, what would you like people to take away from this discussion? What would you like to imprint on? Um, and the public perception uh, of the possibilities of Metro Grow and other uh, uh, vertical farms. Yeah, so again, I think the main thing is, you know, everybody knows we need to increase our local food supply. Uh, that's pretty much a no brainer. Um, traditional ag will help. Regenerative farming coming up will definitely be an asset. Uh, but it's, I think we're at a point where we can't just say either or. It's got to be everything, uh, all different technologies, all different methodologies. So anything we can do to increase the um, amount of local ag is going to be a help. So vertical farming is not a be all end all, but it definitely is a player and should be a, even more a bigger part of that landscape. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kerry Kakazu, Metro Grow Hawaii. It's been great. We've learned a lot and we hope to reconnect with you in the not too distant future. We'll see you again soon. Right. Yeah. Come check out the stuff we got going at Kamaki. That'll be great. Aloha.